it's just not built into everyone to just figure it out. You're built to hunt the answer, whereas <laughs> yes. other people are built to be spoon-fed the answer. <laughs> yeah. People hear over a range of eight octaves. Your eyes are limited to a one octave band of vision. This is Rapalang Rabana. She's one of the smartest people I know, not just in South Africa, but on the continent. I'm going to big it up that hard. Because ultimately, she's been involved in startups since she was at university. She created a mobile competitor to Skype, which was her first exit, I believe, unless she was selling lemonade stands and <laughs> lemonades and that kind of stuff as yeah, your yeah. stereotypical entrepreneur. But rappelang has gone into the incredible things. She's created education businesses. She's done fintech. And most recently, she's been on the cover of Forbes magazine just with some of her developments. It wasn't so recent. I'm getting old now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd never be able to tell. But Rapalang is the founder of Rekindle Learning. We're also going to talk about fast forward innovation because there's cool. a lot of cool work that you're doing there from an apps perspective, design, development, builds, yep. management consultancy. <laughs> like you've, got the, you've got the full suite of things. Yes. And we're going to talk about why not every person should be an entrepreneur. That's, uh, that's quite a controversial one for today. But we're going to dive straight into it. We sure it. can. We Rapa sure Lung, can. Why mm. should not everyone be an entrepreneur? Sure. There, there are so many answers to this question. But for me, it starts with it's not this idealized thing that um, is the ultimate end goal for everyone. I think that life has always been about picking a struggle. You're either picking the struggle of I want to build and do stuff that I think is important and I will tolerate, you know, the unpredictable cash flow and wherever it takes me, or you're picking the struggle of, you know, I want to navigate a large corporate and get to the top of that. And I want that kind of influence and power, or I want to build an NGO that is going to, you know, do stuff. But it's all about picking a struggle and whatever you pick is going to be a struggle. There's no easy way through life. There's no simpler way. Um, and a lot of the time when people think I want to be an entrepreneur, it's because they think it's a, it's an out from corporate or an out from a job. But it's, it's just a different kind of struggle. And you should be able to understand yourself well enough to actually figure out which struggle you want to do and you're suited to do. Um, I did my one corporate stint at, at corporate for, for one year, first time since university. And I, I knew for sure then, and what I knew when I was 22, that it's not the struggle I want to fight. Yeah, I think it's, it's a fascinating one because mm. the more social media proliferates our lives, yeah. the more voyeurism we have and the more keeping up with the Joneses yes. that we actually have in all of our daily lives and channels. And some of our entrepreneur friends mm -hmm. may make it seem glamorous because speaking from both <laughs> your and my experience mm -hmm. is that we have to put on the perception that things are going <laughs> swimmingly always. <laughs> We don't post about the negativity because who's going to want to back you? Who's exactly. going to want to fund you with VC, mm -hmm, venture mm -hmm. capital, if you're a, you're a negative person? Exactly. It's, it's a catch-22, right? Because you, I am really for being authentic. I'm really for, um, you know, walking within your truth and living to your highest values and stuff. And that's why I'm so pretty weak at social media because I just don't know how to play that game and I'm just not investing the energy into it. But at the same time, um, the entrepreneurs who may not be doing, you know, real businesses but have that game tapped are, uh, you know, getting getting that limelight or attention and whatever support. And yeah, it's 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 a tricky one because you don't want to ever look like you're less successful because then a client will be like, oh, but are you still gonna be around next year? Oh, is your business viable? So it's it's always a tough balance for me. And it's similar with professionals. If you yes. think about the last 12, 14, 16 months, how intense that focus has been on our frontline workers, not just in South Africa, but around the globe, how they've been impacted by daily loss of life, by mm -hmm. people getting close to the brink, and how absolutely exhausted they've been from running multiple shifts. Yeah. Like, you don't always see the reality of that. You don't always see doctors coming onto Facebook when they've got a one day <laughs> off saying, oh, wow, that is a terrible week. We lost some lives. Yeah. It's, it's more the celebration of the positives. And even in those professional spaces, so even if our FAs who are listening to this are dealing mm. with certain individuals. Like the positivity that's reflected online is yeah. not always the reflection. And 
You speak about uh, inward reflection. Yes. That there's a lot of inward struggles happening right now in people who are C-suite, who are in corporate, who are professional, and those who are entrepreneurial. Like yeah. everyone, exactly to your point, has their own personal demon and struggle. Correct. And I've been to, you know, Davos in the World Economic Forum annual meeting. And, you know, it's there 3,000 of supposedly the most successful people in the world. And I assure you, they all have struggles. Okay, well, it let's never take a, ends. Let's, let's take a little yeah. divergent course because I, yes. I love the, the WEF conversation. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, here's another different hat that you wore. Are you still involved in World Economic Forum? Are you still a... Yeah. Like, what is your role then? And, and give us a little bit of a... So I'm not employed, but um, the World Economic Forum is really one of those multilateral organizations. It's got lots of networks and communities. So I started in the Global Shapers community, which was really, really fun. It's young leaders below the age of 30 and you run your own hub. So I was in the Cape Town hub and we did some awesome projects. Um, we planted a whole line of trees in Ribeck West. Um, it's a beautiful road now, thanks to that. We did entrepreneurship training workshops. We did um, horticultural training for prisoners in one of the prisons in the Western Cape. Yeah, we built or launched a platform to for volunteers to be able to track their effort and time and the skills they learned so that young people who are trying to get a job can enhance their CV by showing the things that, you know, they volunteered for. It was probably the most impactful time and um, lots of hard work. And then I got too old to stick around <laughs> as it happens. And I was selected as a young global leader a couple of years ago, which is the older people. Um, network. It's like the masters. <laughs> you know, the, the masters of world economic forming. Exactly. Um, and that's that's cool in its own ways. It's very different community, but you get a lot of these executive education things where you get to go to Harvard or the Chinese universities or Yale, etc. cetera. Um, and obviously access to the big regional events and, and Davos which is I really like those events mainly because it allows me to zoom out of my ordinary day life in the hustle and just you know lift my head and see what's happening out there what people are smoking and what people <laughs> think is cool um because you know I forget those things because I'm so much deep in the hustle what I like about your approach to business is that you're able to take a whole bunch of topics a whole bunch of interests but then you're also able to distill that information and mm. take out those like succinct nuggets and those bite-sized pieces of information and yeah. I think that carries through into rekindle learning so I think let's yeah. go in that direction now sure. so from a rekindle learning perspective like the way that I understand it mm. is that you plug into various corporates or C-suite teams and they've got an internal comms need mm. or mm. problem to solve, right? We know you've got thousands of employees, you've yeah. got disparate information, mm. you've got thousands <laughs> of COVID requirements and HR policies. So how do you drill that down into yeah. the most bite-sized, almost in a tweet or mm. in a WhatsApp kind of solution, right? Yeah. And that's effectively what you do. So, yep. so tell me about the problems that you're solving for mm. corporates with your bite-sized information mm. take-outs. Sure. Are you sure you don't want a job at Rekindle Learning? Marketing manager, <laughs> coming in hot. <laughs> Would be great if you came through. So yes, the problem I wanted to solve for isn't um, so much, there's lots of MOOCs out there. There's the Coursera, there's the, the Unimes and tell all the of that. On, tell people listening what a MOOC is. You're going to start <laughs> oh, sprouting it's jargon. <laughs> It's yeah. a massive on, massive open online course. Cool. Basically, it's the, it was the f initial hype around e-learning that, you know, you could go and do your whole MBA online at a Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Coursera, Udemy, it's anything where you can almost online learn yeah. and digest lots of information, information yeah. and either pay for it or have a free version, version of, of it. Exactly. Most of it is free. If you want a certificate, you generally pay for it and stuff. Um, and we're not seeing that great success. You know, the, the throughput rates of the MOOCs are sitting at less than 12% of people that actually start. And a lot of it, I think, is designing digital learning, you know, started from a place where you just put stuff online. It wasn't really changing the learning experience, how much quicker it is to learn. Do you reduce the time to competency, which is what, you know, helped us focus in on the business problem there, because a lot of companies are much worse than the MOOCs. They send memos, long emails with the critical organizational knowledge that they're hoping people will understand about their strategy, their new products, their customer service approach. Click delete. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or they send you, you know, a manual that's, 
gets printed and sits on your desk for those who still go in the office, etc. Cobwebs. <laughs> or they put you on one of those online things with lots of slides and there's a quiz at the end and everyone just skims through. Click, 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 click. And tries to just get through the quiz. So we just looked at that situation. It's like, it shouldn't be this horrible. And it's supposed to actually make life easier for you. And a lot of the challenge is that it's still very passive and static engagement with it. And we realize people enjoy the bite-sized stuff. We see that from social media, etc., And we see that people like the interactive part, which is why they go straight into the quizzes and try to skip as much of the reading as they can. So we sort of then said, let's flip this model and rather let's focus the content on short videos that people would actually watch. And the rest of the content, let's skip the passive reading, make every important principle or insight or business rule, etc., into an interactive question. And it's not just a quiz that you pass or fail. You know, the app tracks what you're getting wrong and right and brings you back to the stuff you're getting wrong, gives you the corrective explanation so that you are now in a position to fix whatever misconception you had and demonstrate that now you understand. And it's all about that competency-based learning as opposed to, I went to the orientation, I clocked an hour, I'm sorted, let me sign with no real, you know, insight or transparency for, for the company in terms of who understands what. And, you know, in mining environments with safety stuff, it's, it's crucial. Everyone will admit that they've signed those yellow or pink forms that they make them sign, but truly they don't remember what's in there. Or in financial services, there's so much happening around banks um, and other entities becoming fully fleshed financial services institutions. That means whole new product sets. It means a whole lot, a whole sort of regulations that they have to master now. Um, and with one of our banking clients, for example, there's a big thing now around phase, which is one of the regulations that financial advisors need to, to be able to sell or render financial services, essentially. And we managed to improve their pass rates so that they have more accredited staff by 30% just by taking those slides that they were doing in those two-day, three-day workshops and actually packaging it into an interactive micro-learning course. And, you know, that takes a huge headache of someone because now they're eligible to stay in their job and get promoted. And people that were failing, you know, got through. It could also be in sales. So like call center agents, for example, that we've worked with, a lot of the time, you know, they've got to sell new products every other month or something. They've got to figure out what this product is about, etc. And we did a, a, a project with a client where one group just did the two hour workshop. The other group had the workshop and the micro learning app. And the group that had the app had a 20% higher sales conversion rate. And it's not complicated content. These are the features, the benefits, the clients it suits, when we want to do what as an organization, our approach, etc. And I think it's because they had that familiarity with what they were doing, they were more confident in that sales approach. Mm -hmm. So every company has a huge base of organizational knowledge they need to disseminate and now that we're remote, distributed, it becomes even more critical to be able to do that consistently so that, you know, the Western Cape isn't outperforming how thing all the time yes. and vice versa. Two comments. Mm. You spend a lot of time in various markets across the continent. You're not just focused on South Africa. So one thing that, that I'm interested in is mm. South Africa's challenge with yeah. critical learning and asking critical questions yeah because i think that there's a huge problem within that space and uh, the other comment is just around the challenge of middle management and i, mm. I feel like there's a <laughs> lot of people with a, a dearth of information and insight and knowledge they may have been in a company for a long time but then that um, knowledge skill mm. and uh, it's not being transferred or shared to middle management and sometimes people are being accelerated from junior positions into the middle without the support the empathy etc that goes mm. with it so so how do we solve one the critical skills challenge and how do we how do we solve the middle management aspect and how do we become a stronger w workforce yeah. um just both body and mind, right? Big questions, big questions. Do you want me to be president and try to sort them out? Let's go critical yeah. thinking first. <laughs> sure. So yeah. the critical thinking, right? Um, what we often miss with learning, because we come from an, uh, you know, an, a school system that was very one directional, passive learning, um, I wrote and test, fashion. yeah, is that we we forgot there's actually multiple modalities or forms of learning. Yes, there's the reading and the knowledge intake, but there's the um, experimental 
mental. Um, there's the experiential learning where you're actually going out into the world and doing what you're learning. Um, and there's the, you know, learning from others' experiences. There's, there's so many forms of ways of learning. And you actually, to develop those higher cognitive skills, you needed to do more modes of learning, which is why stuff like project-based learning is becoming, you know, bigger and bigger. So we would need to change our, yeah, our metrics of success in, 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 in school. Right now you're clocked for doing a test as opposed to um, efforts or exploring X and Y, learning a new thing. Um, and it, it needs a serious, serious overhaul. The other big thing with, with critical thinking is that I'm more worried more about the creativity element than the critical thinking. And in highly analytical education system that we have, we're already, we are taught to filter a lot of stuff and get decide what's good or bad. We do do a lot of judgment training in our education as it is. It's more the ability to go wide and open and explore beyond what you know will work or think will work um, before you go critical thinking and narrowing down to what you're going to execute. So I would, I would invest a lot more effort on the creativity side. I had such an interesting question yes. from my four-year-old the other yeah. day. She came home from school and it, it started pretty simply. <laughs> Dad, what's the opposite of big? Small. Yes. What's the opposite of, <laughs> yeah. you know, dark, light, mm. you know, all that kind of stuff. Then when she moved on to, Dad, what's the opposite of green? Yes. I was like, what? Yes. And it, it was it like absolutely stumped me. Yeah. And, and I think that's the great thing about kids, right, is they look at the world in, that, in a completely different mm. way. Mm. So I had to come up with a creative answer to solve and appease her yes, insight yes, so yes. when i said let me think about this okay ah, well, the opposite of green yes is red she's like why dad and i said well because green <laughs> means go and red <laughs> means stop and she just turned to me and said good oh you know? wow so then like Smarty we kind pants. of had to, <laughs> had to continue this line of questioning for an entire two-hour drive to some sure. city and until she was questioned, uh, yes. she was satisfied with my question. And she yes. started throwing things like purple at me, and it really started bending my brain in a, in, yes. a, in the way yes. where you're like, "This is why people talk about the importance of kids learning mm. based on how they like to play, yes. because they'll be stimulated by the things that actually interest them." So. I think that that's, yeah. a, that's a, a huge comment within there on yes. our education system as a whole and the, the grassroots structure of that. It's, of the, it's yeah, problematic. Sure. And I mean, there's, there's lots of research showing that kids' um, creativity levels are at genius levels before the age of five, seven. And it d continues to decline dramatically until they're 18. Precisely because she's not constrained to think in the binary form that, you know, we are male, female or... Um, whatever the other opposites she came up with, she she could suppose that green has an opposite. And tell me, when you are briefed, you, you're mm. speaking to various levels and various scales. And, you know, we spoke earlier offline in terms of the sprints that you do to help do experimental work or you're testing a hypothesis or you're doing mm. A-B tests or whatever it may be. Mm. So what is the general kind of problem that a business has that might be different between sizes, whether it yeah. be entrepreneurship or a more professional led business or a kind of yeah. behemoth of a corporate <laughs> are there similarities of requests that come through to you to be solved from a, an education need mm. or are there differences based on the scale and the actual whether it is blue collar solved for mines mm. versus white collar solved for a professional institution there's, there's definitely a variety of education needs. So what we're experimenting with at the moment, for example, is for um, technicians or students that are, you know, studying medicine but can't get into the labs now because of COVID, um, etc., is to supplement the theoretical learning with um, VR or virtual reality experiential learning. Um, and we're finding that's becoming more and more important for any, you know, physical hands-on work or blue collar work a lot. Whereas um, in the, you know, white collar professional space, the kind of experiential learning we're needing to create there is quite different. So for those, you know, learning digital skills, like learning how to do cloud and what what's, it's more important that as they're learning the principles of, of stuff and the cloud, it's, they should be able to spin out an AWS environment or et cetera. Tell to the be people, able to, what's AWS? I know, <laughs> Amazon Web Services, basically yeah. one of the um, cloud providers, whether it's Google Cloud or IBM Cloud, etc. And to be able to do that while they're doing the theory is critical to actually understand. So it's still about 
theory and practical, but it comes in different forms depending on, yeah, you know, the, the kind of um, industry and, and work you're in. So they are similar, but implemented differently, I would say. If Very that nice. makes sense. So hypothetically, mm. we live in a world where your offering becomes redundant, which mm-hmm. is terrible for your business and terrible for you as a startup. <laughs> but which, which offering? Your education offering oh. at Rekindle Learning Perspective. In terms of? In terms of like corporate education oh. and knowledge sharing and mm-hmm. building education solves for business. Yes. Right? Okay, sure. If if you were to be be made redundant mm. in your offering, yes. what would need to happen within businesses to empower, enlighten, educate their staff in much better ways? I mean, it's, it's quite a I big think, one. Yeah, I think the, the, the main way you, we would have to become redundant is that the schooling system generates people that can teach themselves, learn and relearn. Then they don't have to be supported in their learning because they can figure it all out themselves. Um, and that's the a while to go, I, I think. I think entrepreneurs are very good at it. Certainly, I taught myself everything um, in my 20s, but it's it's not a thing that everyone does. I mean, um, you know, my boyfriend will still ask me, how do you do that? I'm like, what did Google say? Like, it's out there and it's just not built into everyone to just figure it out. You, you're built to hunt the answer, whereas <laughs> yes. other people are built to be spoon fed the answer. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I think that's it's, it's like it's hunter gathering for the, for the yes, digital age. Exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, Rapalang, mm. I, I love speaking to you so much because there's always like a, a new way that you make me look at, at things and also that's the perspective good. in which you, you uh, almost approach a problem that needs to be solved. So, yeah, mm. tell our yes. listeners, our mm. viewers, yes. tell them where they can find yes, you. Yeah. I mean, you hate sure. social media, so, <laughs> so you, you're I'm very there. difficult. Yeah, I'm there, you've got the I'm presence, there. But what's yes, the best yes, way? Is it, yes. is it a website? Um, LinkedIn is, is where I'll be most of the time. So um, please follow me there. And uh, my website is rappelang.com. So, oh, yeah. it's a great one. Yeah. Eh? I, I got in just, early. It just I shows got your early, early adopter status, <laughs> eh? I bought it a very long time ago. Um, yeah, that's where you'll see a lot of um, conversations I'll have, not just in the learning space, but you know, with, within Fast Forward Innovation, it's also around how do you help organizations innovate faster. So for people that aren't you know, entrepreneurs per se, but um, are keen on innovation and technology and, and stuff, we will often you know, be in a company where we're doing those collaborative design sprints so that they can test out these new ideas, um, revamp the customer experience you know, journey by by figuring out how they can share information, change their processes or upskill their teams in different ways. And it's it's always great in those environments because we force them to work in a different way. Um, it's cross collaborative, across functions, across hierarchy. So we find, you know, a call center agent sitting next to that sous seat and they've just never had that interaction before. And the kinds of ideas that can come out and the synthesis that can come out when you've got that kind of group of people together is is really awesome and ultimately getting them to speak to the customer early most people are terrified to speak to their customers early on in the ideation process and in those four days most people say they've done months and months of work in those four days i think that's the reality it's Mm. like we need to encourage and we need to uplift people to be able to ask more questions that's how you start your journey it's curiosity it's that's the journey to critical thinking that's the journey to going out and hunting your own solves whether it may start as a simple google search or ask your customer (laughs) rapalang always a pleasure lovely chatting to you and it's been a fantastic good to see you you, mike (laughs) prof med future professional shared values one future